alarming revelations today in the German wings crash that killed 150 people. The pilot apparently locked out of the cockpit as the co-pilot deliberately steered the plane into the French Alps. This tragedy raising questions about how a similar situation could be avoided in the future. Fox News' Doug McElway has more. Doug, what can you tell us about the locking mechanism on the door? Well, you know, Melissa, the, the inability of the pilot to get into the cockpit once the, the co-pilot had locked it is, is really turning into one of those classic cases of the law of unintended consequences. These doors were designed in the aftermath of 9-11 to keep bad guys out. We now know it can also have the effect of keeping a bad guy in, or at least a very troubled guy in. The doors were designed to withstand even bullets fired at them. They have a, a double locking mechanism so that in the event that a single pilot inside became incapacitated, the second pilot, who was outside, could type in a code on the door, on the outside of the door, and gain access to it. But the pilot inside can override that code with a second locking mechanism, and that is apparently what happened here. The co-pilot flicked a toggle switch, and uh, as was evidenced by the captain's increasingly uh, desperate knocking on the door, uh, he couldn't get in. The knock became so intense, so frantic, that a source described it to the New York Times as uh, sounding like trying to break the door down. And that was one of the last sounds we heard on the a cockpit voice recorder, that and the screaming from passengers just before the impact. Now, in the United States, the FAA requires two people to be in the cockpit at all times. Lufthansa um, and the other European carriers on intra-European flights have elected to use the one crew member rule. And that gives the person inside control of the airplane all by themselves. So no doubt aviation authorities in Europe may be reconsidering that one person in the cockpit rule. Uh, here in the States, I've, I've been talking to people who suggest now it's time to return to three people in the cockpit, two, two co-pilots and, and a flight engineer. I suspect that the airlines would prohibit that, or rather would uh, protest that vigorously. Uh, the cost-benefit analysis is not real favorable to them. Melissa? Doug, thank you so much for that report. Mm -hmm. A, quote, willingness to destroy this aircraft, that is how French prosecutors are characterizing the actions of German Wings co-pilot Andreas Lubitz. The 28-year-old German reportedly showed no signs of psychological problems during company evaluations. But after locking the pilot out of the cockpit, Lubitz calmly steered the plane into the French Alps, killing all 150 people on board. Earlier, French prosecutors described those harrowing final moments. He didn't say a single word. It's total silence. I think the victims only realized at the last moment because on the recording, you only hear the screams literally on the last moments of the recording. Joining me now by phone is Alan Deal. He is a former FAA and NTSB crash site investigator, also the author of Air Safety Investigators, along with Oliver McGee, Howard University professor of engineering and former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Transportation. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Alan, I want to start with you, because in addition to being a crash investigator, you're also an aviation psychologist. And we just heard... You know, they said there were no clues in his psychological background that this co-pilot would have done that. Do you believe that, or what would you look for as a psychologist? Well, obviously, the uh, first thing we're going to do uh, is, is go out to the house. I understand he lived with his parents. Uh, look for over-the-counter drugs. Look for any indication of medications that he might have been abusing. Uh, talk to people who knew him to see if he had an alcohol problem and see if there was some sort of stress in his life, either a love or a financial disharmony that might have driven him. You know, we've seen this is the fourth one of these airline pilots uh, in uh, the last two decades that have done this uh, mass suicide, well, suicide and mass uh, murder. So it's extremely rare, but there's almost always clues. And apparently in this case, like with the other three, they were missed. Do you believe there's a test or an evaluation that could be done on a consistent basis to smoke this sort of thing out, or can it just happen under the radar in most cases? Well, I, obviously, uh, psychopathology, and I, I am not a therapist, I should stress. I'm a research psychologist. It's very difficult to uh, detect, but there are, there are barriers uh, to try to prevent this. Uh, first of all is the initial hiring screening. Uh, they, do, they do give tests called MMPIs. Uh, that's a Minnesota Motor Physical Personality Test. Uh, the interview, uh, but 
more than more probably more importantly, they have an employee assistance program where pilots that are having these marital problems or financial problems can go talk okay. to a professional counselor, et cetera. And they have a type of training called crew resource management, which empowers other pilots to report this sort of thing. To mention uh, that they're seeing something unusual. Oliver, let me ask you because um, you know, you specialize in technology policy. We've been talking a lot about this door and the locking mechanism and the idea that he was inside and he was able to override that. Ostensibly, that's so that terrorists can't get in and take control of the plane. Is that a mistake? Uh, thank you for having me, Melissa. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, I think Doug's call for um, um, three cockpit rule to ensure that we have at least a two cockpit uh, personnel minimum. Is, is essential. Uh, what we're going to be seeing in, 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 as the policy internationally develops, uh, we're going to go to belts and suspenders. Uh, we have to make sure that at least inside of this secure area called the cockpit, which is a very different security area than the cabin itself, has qualified people who can fly the aircraft at all times. Oliver, it seems like though this is one of those things where no matter what we do, you know, the crazy person can do something like this. I mean, if he had other people in the cockpit, couldn't he have just killed them before he crashed the plane? Uh, that's a possible scenario, but the key thing is, is we're not really necessarily talking about terrorism today or are we talking about suicide. We're talking about a criminal act, and oftentimes when you have two people, that's a bigger threshold because you have to have a conspiracy. And so right now, we can't at least have one person who is basically psychologically unstable and is basically controlling the entire aircraft. This was a tragedy for the families who lost lives, Alan, uh, for the lost loved ones. Do you agree with that? Uh, yes, uh, up to a point. I, I don't think we're going to see a, a, a third pilot in the cockpit. Uh, as we all know, there's a huge uh, pilot shortage right now. As a matter of fact, uh, this pilot only had, uh, the co-pilot only had 600 hours. So I, I don't, I literally don't think there's enough uh, pilots, uh, the number of pilots in the world is insufficient to bring back the third pilot. The idea of putting uh, a flight attendant in like we do post 9-11 may have to be reconsidered by the German regional carriers. Yeah. Oliver, what about that? I mean, a lot of people are, are, are making something of the fact that he only had 600 hours of flying. Is that a problem in this as well, or do you think it did not figure in? Oh, that's a problem, too. Uh, we're going to see more proliferation of these low-hour pilots because as we see the proliferation of low-cost carriers, as in this case, as the industry changes and unfolds, uh, we're going to run, as the uh, expert has said, is, uh, we're going to run out of pilots. Yeah. But what we, what we should do is at least have some threshold because in, whether you're in an Airbus A320 or even a lower-cost carrier, there are lives on board. And when we lose right. 150 people, that's a troublesome. And one more point I'd like to share with you, Melissa. Yeah. We've now counted 950 lives lost this year. Uh, that's the most lo lives lost in uh, international commercial aviation since six and a half decades. So oftentimes what happens is we will go back and look at the Air France 447 report. These recommendations were all in there and we got to have stop having these reports sit on the radiator because they're actually coming to true life scenarios. And usually I think that leads us to go and start doing some belts and yeah. sus sus suspenders so we can ensure that everybody's safe when they're flying. Gentlemen, thanks to both of you. That's a really scary stat. Thank you for bringing it to us though. Important. All right, we want to get a quick check.